Since we currently have government-approved self-isolation, it is time to talk about German one-man bunkers, or one-man preservation shelters from the Second World War. Now many of you probably know them from the computer game series Fallout. Yet these things were around for a lot longer. In this video I will talk mostly about German World War II variants, but they were also produced in the United Kingdom, France, Italy, Belgium and likely other countries as well. Furthermore, during the Vietnam War, a large amount of tiny shelters were built by the North Vietnamese as well. Now these things came with many different names and types. Fragmentation protection cell, air raid shelter, fire watch post, post office, detached individual shelter, the most common term used by the population was one man bunker. Problem is, these bunkers are not particularly well researched. So my main source is basically one book here, which explicitly notes that numbers are estimated and many details are unknown. Note, for this video I refer to them mostly as shelters, bunkers and one man bunkers. First, let us look at the purpose of these little bunkers. They should provide protection from incendiary bombs and fragments for both observation and guard personnel of towns, factories, warehouses, military locations and other facilities. As such, there were certain requirements. Possibility to observe the objects that should be monitored, ideally by providing a 360 degree view. A short distance to the object in question, protection against debris and fragments, proper access and escape routes, and proper entering of the bunker on the site or building it is placed on. Similarly, the bunker should fit into the surrounding area. Although usually they were called one-man bunker, if they were used as a firewall shelter, they needed space for at least two people. These cells, as firewatch posts and factory premises, had a telephone connection, electric light and provided space for at least two people. Certain structural conditions had to be met to achieve the specified degree of protection. 51 cm of thickness for brick work walls, 40 cm for stamped concrete and 25 cm for reinforced concrete. Note that these values are from September 1942 and refer to a degree by the Ministry of Aviation. Although it should be added that depending on the quality also 15 cm of reinforced concrete could be used as well. Now let us move on to the main uses for these shelters. These were the German National Railway, the Deutsche Reichsbahn, which used it at barrier guards, marshalling yards, stations and other important facilities. Of course the Wehrmacht used them at barracks, airfields, ammunition depots, shipyards, headquarters and other locations. And the industry used them in everything from factories to mines. They were also used by various others, for instance in concentration camps, by the military engineering organization TOT, and even by civilians. The author estimates that probably more than 10,000 were built during the war. Which raises the question of effectiveness. Well, there are very few examples mentioned and they range from one extreme to the other. During an air raid on Lübeck on June 4th, 1944, the Draeger plants were also hit. Next to a fragmentation protection cell made of steel by Mannesmann, a 500 kg bomb fell at a distance of only 5 meters. The crew survived the close hit with a broken heel. There are some points here we need to discuss. 5 meters seems a rather short distance. Similarly, 500 kg bombs were less often used than 250 kg bombs. Also since the Allies used pounds not kilogram, it is likely that it was actually a 500 pound bomb. Yet even if a 1000 pound bomb was used, it would be less than 500 kilogram to the kilogram to pound conversion. Now although a structure might sustain such a blast, the issue is that occupants still might suffer from blast injuries especially affecting the lungs and other organs. For example. A German test from 1941 concluded that an explosion of a 250 kg bomb, 3 to 4 meters away from a T-34, had no effect on the tank, but all the test animals inside were dead. Yet these tanks were not built to withstand an air blast, whereas the regulations for these bunkers specifically mentioned that they had to sustain air blasts to a certain degree. Additionally, this was 1944, by that time the Germans had quite some experience. Yet the problem is, steel shelters were rather uncommon, especially late war. So this might have been an early war variant. But maybe it was upgraded with a concrete shell. As such, this statement without further information raises more questions than it provides answers. Another extreme sample is going completely into the other direction. 
The eyewitness Gerahane on the one-man bunkers? One-man bunkers were actually everywhere, but were considered unsafe. It was said that they were knocked over by the air pressure. They stank terribly and were mainly used as urinals. This account seems a bit suspicious, as these bunkers were often equipped with anchorage to prevent that they would fall over, as discussed in the requirements. As such, the eyewitness was likely at a site which didn't use anchoring. But this is only a small sample set. Another issue is that some witnesses also bring up the most vivid examples, for various reasons. One might be that they have remembered them more easily, others for the dramatic effect. Now before we go deeper, there was a Prima model that was also patented that probably comes closest in concept to the Polovsky preservation shelter of the Fallout series. In 1932, Wilhelm Heinrich Daniels filed a patent with the title Selbstständiger Schutzraum gegen Geschosse und Kampfgase, Independent Shelter against Projectiles and Combat Gas, which was granted in 1936. Sadly, Google Patent doesn't have a drawing for this one. Foyd Rovitz describes it as follows. It was a cauldron-like body made of metal, which placed on a chassis became mobile, equipped with a headlight on the roof and a cone-shaped rear. The vehicle looked more like a futuristic prop from a science fiction movie than an air raid shelter. One that probably comes closest to the Pulowski shelter in terms of appearance is this one. Note that the dimensions etc. might be off, since it's reconstructed from a photo. As you can see, the shape is similar and both have rather large doors. Notice that the design changed also through different Fallout games as well, and the ones in the game had ventilation piping not shown here. Anyway, back to history. As mentioned before, the one-man shelters were used for air raid protection in Germany during the Second World War. So let us look at some guidelines and regulations. At the beginning of the war, no specific regulation by the Ministry of Aviation had been published, according to Friedrichs. Although the book is from 2007, so this might be not current anymore. Although we have data for mid to late war. In September 1943, there was a guideline from the Ministry of Aviation about the production of fragmentation protection cells, Splitterschutzzelle, for civilian air raid protection. Here are some of the relevant quotes. Fragmentation protection cells are used to house one or more observers during an air raid. They protect against fragments from demolition bombs, direct hits from microdrop ammunition and construction debris. Cells from more than four persons are not permitted. As such, these were not regular air raid shelters for protecting civilians. They were intended for specific personnel and limited in their capacity. Fixed and movable versions are possible. The choice of cell shape is optional within the limits given in paragraph 3 and 4. In terms of dimensions, it was defined that for each person there should be at least 0.6 square meter of space on the ground, but that it could be reduced to 0.3 square meter at the height of 1.6 meters. As such, quite many cone-shaped variants existed. Yet, the total area must be at least 1.5 square meters. Furthermore, the requirements defined which type of concrete was to be used and of course included a German industry norm. Also, it was defined that the shelters had to sustain an air blast. The fragmentation protection cells must be sufficiently stable and resistant to air blast and debris loads. This is considered to be fulfilled if the proof is provided by a strength calculation verified by an approved test engineer. The determination of the forces is to be carried out according to German industry norm 1055, sheet 4, table 2, with a dynamic pressure Q. 2500 kg per square meter. As such, if your personal self-isolation chamber does not fulfill these criteria, be sure to contact a local German military engineer in order to bring your construction up to scratch. They will also know about the new requirements from December 1944 by the Air Ministry, issued based on experience that required that the top and doors should be made out of one piece since those were the elements that usually would be affected by the most stress. There were many manufacturers and as such types and variants, yet the two basic main types were metal and concrete shelters. Metal shelters were rather common in early war, yet the numbers decreased over the course of the war. This was likely due to steel being used for wartime equipment where concrete could not be used as a substitute like tanks, machine guns and ammunition. Additionally, if those metal shelters had only a thin and non-hardened steel plate of like 5mm, they were susceptible to fragmentation damage. 
Moreover, soon after the war began, it became clear that the fragmentation protection cells made of metal no longer met the requirements. They had to be covered by an additional concrete layer of 25 cm. A fragmentation safe variant had steel plates of around 15 to 20 mm. One typical example of the metal shelter was the bell shaped one from Mannesmann, which had a 10 mm thick steel wall. Note this was a pre war model. It had a height of about 2.50 meter and a diameter of about 1.45. Note that the British had a very similar looking metal shelter known as the console shelters from Nickel Works in Birmingham. Yet by far the most common were the concrete shelters. As such, let us look at a common example of which one is located in the Militärgeschichtliche Museum der Bundeswehr in Dresden. It is from Dividag and they had a rather simple design as you can see. It had a height of about 2.48 meters outside and inside was about 1.82 meters. The walls had a thickness of 0.50 meters. The door was about 0.6 meters wide and had a height of about 0.8 meters. Notice there was also a two door variant with identical doors on both sides, whereas one could function as an emergency exit if the order was blocked. The shelter was anchored on the ground with six bolts. Similarly, the top was fixed with six bolts to the main body. And if you look closely enough, you can see the areas here at the top. This variant was intended for two to three people and had a total weight of 4110 kg. It required 750 kg of high quality cement and 350 kg of rolling mills products or 330 kg if it was the two door variant. The price for the two door variant was 525 Reichsmark whereas the one door variant was already available at 480 Reichsmark. Although before you buy one I suggest you take a closer look at them preferable in Dresden. We can also check out the Kettengrad, Infanteriegeschütz 18 and various other equipment which I discussed with Jens Wehner on my second channel. Anyway, time for a short look at the post-war situation. Although the Allies included these shelters in their demilitarization goals, some survived to this day. There were likely several reasons for this. First off, a lot of these bunkers were built. Second, they were rather inconspicuous, especially if one thinks about the flak towers. And we know that quite many of the flak towers survived since they were rather hard to get rid of. Third, compared to all the other war material, these shelters had a very limited to no threat potential. Of course, there were regional differences and in some areas the removal was more rigorously performed than in others. Furthermore, some might have been kept in order to reuse them. After all, the Federal Republic of Germany in 1955 issued new regulations. For the Federal Republic of Germany, the standards for the fragmentation protection cells continued to apply for a new, now federal German civil defense program. The guidelines were 1 square meter for the inner area, 2 meters clearance height and 0.7 meters for the smallest clearance. To summarize, although in Fallout the one man shelter seemed to be more of a joke, in the second war where these shelters were likely quite useful. This is based on the following known elements. First, a large amount of these bunkers was constructed and used throughout the war in Germany. Second, Germany was heavily bombarded throughout the war, as such there was no lack of experience. Third, in 1942, 1943 and 1944 regulations were released on the construction of these shelters that drew from these experiences. Fourth, these regulations also included specific requirements to shield against the air blasts. This is important since we know that bombs had a very limited effect on tanks and bunkers, yet that the air blast could kill the crews. Fifth, Germany faced a shortage of all kinds of resources and cement was also required on the Atlantic Wall, reconstructing factories and infrastructure. As such, it would be very unlikely, yet not impossible, that these bunkers would not be constructed in such a scale if they were ineffective. One possibility could be that they only served as a morale boost. Yet in such a case, the regulations would probably have been different and contain more information about on how to inform potential users. Then again, Remember this topic is not well researched. Well the next time you need to self isolate, we have one more option now. Thanks to Jens, Bismarck and Schiftum for providing additional information on the effects of bombs versus tanks and other objects. Special thanks to Andrew for reviewing the script. Thank you to the Militärhistorische Museum der Bundeswehr Dresden for inviting me. A big thank you as well here to my Patreon and subscribers and supporters that make videos like this possible. As always, source are listed in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.